Since then, I, I know you've done a lot of work to advance public awareness in this area. Um, but first, what do we actually mean by aging? How do we define it? Yeah, it's an important question. And if you think about it, it's crazy that we need to ask this question because humanity has been so preoccupied with aging for thousands of years. You would have thought we would have come up with an agreed definition, but you're quite right. Different people have different definitions. So the way I define aging is I say that it's the combination of two processes. One process that goes on throughout life, which is the accumulation of damage in the body that is created as consequences of the body's normal operation and uh, metabolic network. That damage consists of changes to the molecular and cellular structure and composition of the body. And the reason we use the word damage to describe those changes is because the body is only set up to tolerate a certain amount of it um, before the body starts to work less well, both mentally and physically. And that's the second process, of course, the process whereby damage starts to create pathologies of late life uh, once that threshold level of abundance of damage has been exceeded. And those pathologies, of course, get worse and worse and eventually we die. So that's what aging is. It's the combination of a lifelong process of creation of damage and a late life process of creation of pathologies. The reason it's so important to end aging is simply because people don't like getting sick, especially not sick in the way that people get late in life, where they get worse and worse and eventually they die. And all we need to do, therefore, is when we say we want to end aging, is to allow our metabolism to continue working, in other words, allow us to carry on being alive, without having this consequence of these emerging and progressive pathologies. There really are no rational reasons to be concerned about ending aging, any more than there are any rational reasons to be concerned about ending Alzheimer's disease or cancer or heart disease. But it was, until I came along really, it was rational to trick yourself into thinking it was rational to um, have concerns. Because until then, we had this knowledge that aging is this terrible thing that's going to happen to us sometime in the future. And we don't want to spend our miserably short lives preoccupied by that thing. We want to be able to get on and enjoy ourselves and make the best of it. So if we can somehow trick ourselves into thinking that aging is some kind of blessing in disguise, or even into thinking that it is off limits to medicine because it's too kind of woven into the fabric of the universe, then it helps us not to think about it. And that used to make sense. It's only since we've actually had a plan, a real strategy for going about developing medicines that will bring aging to an end, that the ambivalence about, um, about aging has become a huge part of the problem because it slows things down. It means that there's less enthusiasm for spending taxpayers' money on this research, for example. So lives are being lost as a result. Well, when I first started thinking about how we might keep people healthy when they were born a long time ago, that question that you've just asked is exactly the one that I felt we needed to ask. We need to say, okay, what are the alternatives? The people who studied the biology of aging had begun, even in the early days of the 20th century, to realize that aging was different from infections in terms of the way that medicine would need to do something about it. That with infections, you can wait until someone gets the infection, and then you can treat them with antibiotics or whatever. And of course, there are preventative treatments, vaccines against certain types of infections, but mostly what's done is treatment. And so people had been trying to treat the health problems of late life, but they'd made no progress. And the field of gerontology emerged when people started to realize that we needed to be more preventative simply because 
the health problems of late life are not like infections, they are side effects of being alive. So, uh, people said, well, okay, maybe we can make the body run more cleanly and not generate so much damage in the first place as a side effect of metabolism. But it turns out that that too is completely impossible because the, 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 dam the creation of damage is just too inextricably intertwined with the things that we need our metabolism to do to keep us alive. You can't have one without the other. So I came along and said, well, okay, so we can't have damage without pathology, and we also can't have metabolism without damage, but maybe we can repair the damage every so often. If we can do that, then we can let these processes where metabolism creates damage and where damage creates pathology, we can let those processes alone. We don't even need to understand them particularly well because they can just carry on. We can instead separate the processes from each other by repairing damage. And it took me maybe 10 years to really convince my colleagues who were studying the biology of aging that this was a sensible approach. But now it's completely mainstream. Everyone realizes that, yes, this is a good way to go. Yes, I have listed seven major types of damage which we need to fix. And other people in the past decade since this idea has become mainstream, they have kind of reinvented the same idea. And some of them come up with different numbers like nine or six. Really, it's the same idea, though. It's not that, um, you know, other people, some people are coming up with new types of damage that other people overlooked. It's just a different way of subdividing a very large number of different actual types of damage into, into categories. Now, you may ask, what's so important about these categories? Uh, and it has limitations to those applications. So, for example, CRISPR, there's one big thing that it can't do, which is it can't insert large new sequences into the genome at a particular place in the way that we need for many gene therapy applications, where we need to introduce a whole new gene, for example. So we still need other methods like traditional viruses to do that. Of course, that may not be true forever. It may be possible to enhance or modify CRISPR so that it can insert large sequences. And indeed, already we've seen in the past few years, a lot of advances that allow CRISPR to be used for things that the original version could not. Like, for example, now there are ways to use it on the mitochondrial DNA, which previously didn't work. Um, and we can use it to make um, changes that are safer because they don't involve breaking the DNA in the process. Um, so lots of things have happened already. So uh, the, the people often wonder whether um, progress is just steady and slow and incremental or whether it goes in leaps. And the reason why this is a hard question to answer is because it depends how you look at it. Um, if you look at it from the coal face, so to speak, from the laboratory bench where people are making um, the actual advances, then it's mostly slow and steady. There are occasional big sudden breakthroughs, but they come as surprises. But the important thing is the consequences of that slow, steady progress. And this is a kind of, it's just a fact of engineering. Of course, medicine is, if you like, a subset of engineering, right? So engineering is like that. You, if you have a bunch of, uh, you can have a design for something that does something really clever, and it's got lots of components, and all the components have got to do their own thing. And those little components may individually be fairly easy to develop, but some of them may be harder than others. And you've got to get them all right before the overall thing works. So, you, so once you've got the last one working, you've got a sudden leap in what you can do relative to how it was before. The other ideas that I've had, like, for example, how to um, obviate mitochondrial mutations, or to use bacterial enzymes against waste products in the body. These are, um, you know, these are ideas, but they're just like ideas that any other scientist would have. In fact, both of those ideas were, people had had them before, so they weren't even original with me. Um, so uh, most of what I've been doing really is not so much the Eureka moments. It's really been putting together a lot of other people's ideas and making some kind of um, coherent and comprehensive strategy out of all the ideas added together.